So neurocognitive outcomes um, mm. are very important. So how do neurocognitive outcomes in pediatric onset MS differ from adult onset disease and what interventions mitigate um, kind of academic and occupational disability? Oh, um, this is an area where <laughs> there's a lot of data missing. Um, one thing we know for sure is just the length of time you have the disease. So um, cognitive deficits occur in MS for many reasons. We think there's an underlying, first of all, there's atrophy. Forget the demyelination effect, the inflammatory effect. There's neurodegeneration. There's true neurons, neuronal death and dying and like occurs over time. Um, there's what we call smoldering inflammation that it's still there. It's, it's inflammation that doesn't truly quiet down. And so we know that this is happening from early on. It's not you've had MS for a long period of time, then you get from relapses to having um, a disability that's progressive, right? So since we know there's relapses and this is happening from the beginning, like I mentioned earlier, our medications work very well on the inflama inflammation part. They're not good at the neuronal net. So this is happening. So the earlier you've had the disease, the longer you're doing this. Um, so having said that, I can say that cognitive effect. So by a lot of it is medi can get mitigated by therapy. Mm -hmm. Part of it, because... Inflammation in itself would would cause lesions, which over time would occupy the brain, and then you're losing brain mass. There's the neurodeath, which will also just over time cause disability. Um, so having all of this just puts our patient at risk of having cognitive deficits earlier in life and more profound by the time they get to ages where they're now 45, um, and yes, they've had MS since they were 15, for 30 years compared to being diagnosed at 30, when you're 65, things are different. So um, we see the effect much sooner. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, unless we're treating it better, and by better, I don't know that the therapies we have are covering it. Mm -hmm. What are your hopes for the future of research and care? Um, Just a few. <laughs> I'm sure there are many. One is having research studies that are focused on... I know all research studies are focused on clinical care. There's a lot going on on trying to cure MS. We want that. There's a lot going on on... Um, the remyelination and, and all of that. Um, we we need clinical endpoints that can affect what we do in guidance, like the studies that we, we, we just talked about, about pregnancy and being able to have answers on what therapies we can use. Um, we need to do more of those kind of studies. We also have to be doing our research in the right population. By right, I just mean inclusive. Um, you're not going to find answers where you're not looking. And for many years, MS was the was the disease of Caucasian women of childbearing age. But no, it's not. <laughs> and it has never been that. Um, so uh, to be able to get our patients involved in research, we have to design studies that they can see benefit from. And we need to to get them to trust us enough that they are willing to be part of our studies because we need them to understand we're studying so we can treat everyone better. Um, and yes, there are many aspects of this disease that it's not just age, it's race, it's cultural too, it's ethnicity, because that does change our, our microbiome. That uh, has a lot to do with uh, our immune systems. Um, there's a lot we don't know. There's room for growth. Well, I'm looking forward to the future for sure. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for joining us on MD Newsline Podcast. It's been a pleasure.